we're so close. Normally, I wouldn't need to record all these videos. I would have probably finished the project already. But you know what? I make this content and I do it for you. So I would appreciate it if you liked and subscribed. For those of you that are new here, we're trying to automate uploading TikTok videos to YouTube Shorts. 100% automated, no watermark and for free. I've been saying that so many times already, but you know what it is? Let's get into it. Today, we're going to be talking about the design phase. In the first video, in the execution plan, we talked about these topics. I'll pop it up somewhere on the video. Let's go through each one real quick and finally end with what everyone's looking for, the system and architecture. First, is this even possible and what are the core features? Let's go through each of the many problems that we covered in the previous videos and decide what is our primary and backup plan. Scraping TikTok. We need to figure out a way to get the videos from the TikTok account to make sure that we're grabbing the new ones. How are we going to do this? We're going to use a package called TikTok Signature. We found this during one of the engineering discovery videos. What it pretty much does is it opens up a headless browser. It then uses one of TikTok's libraries to sign the XCD parameters that we can then use to make an API call to TikTok and get the proper results back. We want to do this because we get a nice data structure back from the API. I call and there's not going to be that much brittleness to it. The only risk here is that TikTok is always changing the way their APIs work and putting new security measures in place. So at any point in time, this can probably stop working and then we'll have to figure out a new solution or maybe go to our backup. So what's our backup solution? We're going to make a direct HTTP request call to the TikTok page get my HTML and then parse it. It's incredibly brittle. I don't want to do this. Anyone that's done front end scraping before knows how brittle it is. You need to have a lot of failure logic to make sure you're not messing anything up. But I know for a fact this is going to work. You just need to get the HTML, extract the data, normalize it, sanitize it, and then send it over to our database. Downloading the non watermark video. There's no way around this. We have to use a third party downloader. We looked around a lot during engineering discovery and we did not find a way to get the non watermark URL. We can't guess the CDN that it lives on. There was a bit of an inkling where you can spin up like blue stacks and reverse engineer the mobile app to get the non watermark URL, but that's as much effort as just doing front end scraping and a lot more complexity on the infrastructure side of things. So I don't want to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up a headless browser. We're going to go all the way to one of the third party downloader sites like SnapTick. And then we're just going to automate the button presses and a human action to get the URL and maybe even download the video, depending on what we are going to do for the next mini problem. We don't have a backup solution for this. There are a lot of third party downloading websites out there. So if one breaks, we're just going to go on to the other one. Maybe in V2, we'll try to figure out a better way to do this. But honestly, it's a personal project and it's a V1. So we're going to go with the quick and dirty method. All right. Next mini problem is actually problem three and four uploading and publishing. We're combining these two together because it just makes sense to do so. The operation to upload and publish on the YouTube API is just a single call there with some configuration. And if we go with the Zapier method, they handle the upload and publishing for us. So it makes sense to kind of join the two problems together into one. So let's talk about the solution. Number one, we're going to try to use Zapier. It's our primary. And we already kind of saw in the previous video that Zapier is not in a good place. So why do we still want it as a primary option? Because it's incredibly simple and has like pretty much no effort at all. It's 15 minutes of setup and it should just work. I'm choosing to believe that once we get to that stage, Zapier will have solved everything. Based on the comments of that one forum post that we found in previous videos, it's not looking good. So, you know, it is what it is. I'm choosing to be hopeful, but we're probably gonna have to go over to our backup plan, which is to use the YouTube API. And what that means is that our business logic is a bit more complicated because we actually have to deal with figuring out the URL, downloading the video, and then uploading it to YouTube all within the code ourselves. It's additional effort, additional complexity. We got to figure out our space issues if the video gets too large. And of course, there are other complexities that we got to deal with on YouTube side. For instance, if we want our API calls to be able to set our video to public, we're going to have to verify our app. And that means going through the entire audit process. 
We're also going to have to deal with quota limits. I think out of the box, you get something like 10,000 credits and a single video upload is something like 1,600. So that's something like six videos a day that we can do. Or was it a month? I got I to look at the quotas, but it's, it's crazy stringent. The pros of using YouTube API is that we actually have a lot of flexibility and control over it because we are writing the code ourselves. That's always a plus. All right, so hopefully we've structured all the problems and solutions well so that we know exactly what we're going to do. Let's talk about the things that we won't do, which is arguably as important as talking about the features and the scope and the requirements that we're going to build. Take note, this is something that you really should do at work, because if you don't state what you're not going to do, it's very easy to get scope creep within your projects. I've been through this time and time again, just a quick word of advice to all my engineers out there who's watching this video. Number one single custom user only we're building this as a v1 poc for one user which is my account it's sort of designed to be scalable but there's going to be a lot of hard-coded ids and things there and it's essentially custom fitted to my own use case we do have an easy path for based on our architecture to be able to extend into multiple users but we'll think about doing that once we've actually proven out this thing end to end number two we're not going to go for video parity between tiktok and youtube and what that means is that tiktok will have all the videos it'll be the source of truth we're not expecting every single one of those videos to make it over to youtube maybe there's going to be system failures and and the scraping job fails or something like that and we throw out the job and never go back to again that's okay we're gonna accept that sometimes the video is too large i don't know there's there's a lot of complexities that come with file transport and uploading and all these rules with youtube so if we don't get all the videos over to youtube that's okay number three minimal security in v1 i mean we're gonna do all the standard stuff like we're not gonna hard code our api keys we're gonna have proper secrets management but what we're gonna do is we're gonna rely on all the things coming out of the box from aws that's why we chose to go serverless we chose to go with aws because there are quite a bit of security features that we get by default we're not going to do anything on top of that because this is just a poc and it's way more effort than it's worth to talk about security this early in the game next one and i like this one no automated tests if this was a work project i care a lot about tests but this is a personal project and i'm feeling reckless i mean i might throw in a couple of tests just to make sure that the dev process is sped up because it is pretty annoying kind of clicking through manually on lambda but we're not going to write any tests to ensure functionality is stable why are we doing this because we can and we don't ever have the other opportunity to in the workplace so i'm going to do this no automated tests next no ci cd we're going to manually deploy using terraform on the cli i'm the only person deploying this so it it's okay to do so it takes some time to set up a CI CD pipeline, especially if I'm using Terraform and serverless. So I'm not going to do that. It's more effort than it's worth to prove out a V1. And this is okay. So if we do try to extend this into a platform, then I'll put a pipeline in. But for the most part, we're just going to leave it for now. Next, no observability in the system. We're going to use whatever is coming out of the box. So AWS CloudWatch logs. We're just going to try to figure things out. The scale and concurrency of this entire system isn't going to be too much. So we should be able to manually go through everything and figure out any problems that exist. And then lastly, no self recovery. If something breaks, we're going to have to manually go in there and fix it ourselves. We might have some monitoring and alerting just to let us know that things are broken, but we're not going to have the system self recover. All right. I hope that was pretty interesting. I very much like to talk about the things that we won't do in any setting, especially at work, because it makes it so much easier just to explicitly state the exact scope. Hopefully this helps you out with your projects at work and you start telling people exactly what you're not going to do and have people sign off on things. I found that there's a lot of creators out there in the tech space that don't talk about this too much. So hopefully it helps you out. Let's go on to the next section, accepted limitation. Accepted limitations are things that are kind of functionality within the system, but we're going to be okay with it not working like an enterprise grade production level system. All right, number one, we're not going to go back in history to find all the videos of the user. We're just going to make one call to grab the most recent videos from that user. And from what I remember, it's about 30 videos. For me, I post about once a day. Sometimes I skip a day, sometimes I do two a day. So this is going to be about two to three weeks worth of videos, which is good 
good enough for me. We're not going to do pagination or anything like that. We can extend this after V1 is built out, but for now, we're accepting this as a limitation. Next, we have no way of getting the non-watermark video ourselves. As we mentioned in the solution section, we're going to have to use a third-party downloading website. Next, fault tolerance is going to be non-existent for our system as well as for the third-party system. So Zapier, YouTube, if those go down, there's no way for us to recover. We're just going to have to wait it out. And if our system goes down, we'll have to manually fix it ourselves. If a job fails, yeah, you know, we'll throw out the job and the system will keep running. But if the whole system goes down, then we're going to have to figure something out. We'll, we'll have to deal with it manually. I mean, we have Terraform, which makes the whole thing super easy, but we'll still have to manually go through everything. Next, there is assumed to be only one instance of the main scraping job. There's no scaling control on this job. So if for some reason, AWS messes up or we messed up our configuration of the infrastructure and there's two of these jobs happening concurrently, then we're going to have duplicates upload to YouTube, but it could be pretty catastrophic depending on how many videos are found. The next step to this after V1 is we move over to a proper database to do unique keys and deduplication and stuff like that. Next, Airtable has a limit of 1200 rows. What this essentially means is that we probably have to go and clean it up once per year, which is pretty good. By next year, I'm pretty sure I would have probably moved to a better system anyway. And then lastly, the front end scraping is limited and it's gonna be incredibly brittle. We're gonna accept this and we're gonna manually fix it. There's probably a bunch of other limitations I'm not listing here. Honestly, I don't really wanna talk about the limitations. It's gonna be a lot. I just wanna to get to the fun stuff, which is building this out. The next item on the list is spikes. We kind of already did this with product and engineering discovery, so I'm not gonna get into it. Basically, what I wanna say about this section is that we have not written a single line of code yet, and that's how spikes should be. When you're doing any sort of discovery, you shouldn't need to write any code. There are edge cases where you do, but you shouldn't be spending too much time. If you are relying on writing code to understand how to implement something, you've got a problem. All right, the video is getting kind of long, so we'll cut it right there. I was going to get into architecture, but it's going to be equally as long, so we'll leave it for the next video. If you're interested, tune in then. Otherwise, if you want to help me out with the YouTube algorithm, comment something, give me questions that you want to ask. If you don't know what to comment, let's just say the keyword would be design. So comment that below if you got this far. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate you. Take care of yourself and I'll see you in the next one.